Good morning. Well, you know, today is uh, April Fool's Day, and uh, I thought this morning when I heard the weather forecast and they said 25 degrees wind chill, that that's what they were talking about. So, but we have a warm audience here, and I'm Vanessa Northington Gamble, and I'm a university professor of medical humanities and a professor of health policy and uh, American studies at the George Washington University. And I'm a physician, historian, and a social uh, activist, and I do uh, ethics on the side. And we have, um, we have three fantastic speakers today. Um, and, uh, or is it four? I think it is three. And, um, but the thing is, not only are they, are they terrific, they are very, there's four, I'm sorry. Okay, there's four speakers. Right. Oh, that's right. I forgot. We have also have somebody on the on uh, coming um, um, uh, by Zoom, and not only are they terrific speakers, but they are very brave speakers because this is the group looking at social determinants of inequities in obesity prevention and control. So that last slide that Shariki showed that had almost everything on it, this is the group that is going to address this in 15 minute presentations. <laughs> so um, so they'll, they'll, they deserve more than a, a, a standing ov uh, ovation. And the, co uh, the complete bios for our, our speakers are in your briefing book. And the title of this session is Social Determinants of Inequities and Obesity Prevention and Control. And what this group is going to do, this panel of speakers, is to, to examine why the concepts and principles of health equities and inequities are important to society at, uh, at large, as a whole, that this is not an issue just for people of color. So they're going to be uh, talking about that. But they also are going to be looking at uh, contextual perspectives, history, culture, and we've already started doing some of that this morning, law, immigration status, um, um, and um, socioeconomic status. And hold your questions. We're going to have a panel dis a, a group at the end. But the other, uh, our, uh, the other thing, too, is that I hope we have a robust discussion uh, of, these, uh, of these issues. And our first speaker is um, Angie McGowan, and she's from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And she is a project director at the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. And she's going to be looking at legal perspectives and looking at uh, health equity and health inequity. So uh, Ms. McGowan, please come join us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm glad that you got the introduction that we're covering those big slides, because it took a lot to figure out exactly what to cover in 15 minutes. So um, apologies, I won't get through all of it, but I will try to go pretty quickly and happy to talk about any other questions or examples um, during the discussion point. So um, just as background, I was asked to kind of look at three questions looking at civil rights laws. What's the role of law in achieving health equity and addressing legal barriers? How have civil rights laws in the past addressed health inequities and medical discrimination? What has been the impact of these laws? And can current civil rights laws address health inequities? And what are the limits of such solutions? Um, and then finally, a little some thinking on potential role for law and policy solutions to help address obesity and reduce health inequities, the focus today. So I work with healthy people. Um, the National Health Agenda, our health promotion initiative, it's, um, we're in our fourth decade now and starting to look at our fifth decade. Um, but just wanted to point out that this is something looking at measurable targets um, that we as a nation, not the federal government, are trying to reach. Um, it requires data-driven outcomes and as a model for program and planning. Um, and I know you can't read all this, but just wanted to point out that both the mission, the vision, and the overarching goals really touch on what we're talking about today. So a society when all people live long, healthy lives, um, increasing public awareness and understanding of the determinants of health, disease, and disability and opportunities for progress, um, the need to engage multiple sectors to strengthen policies and improve practices, um, and as far as the overarching goals, achieving health equity, eliminating disparities, improving the health of all groups. 
Um, one of the frameworks Healthy People uses is the Social Determinants of Health Framework, very in line with what we're talking about today. Um, it involves five key domains. You can see here economic stability, education, health and health care, neighborhood and built environment, and social community context. Each of these have a number of things that go under them, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a bit. Um, but today, for kind of the focus, since we have 15 minutes, I'm going to really dive in a little bit more into the health and health care and the education domains. So what's the role of law in achieving health equity and legal barriers? Um, I couldn't help but getting a little bit broader first on law and policy. So why do we even want to think about law and policy? Why would this be helpful to this work? Um, law is very helpful as a lever to really help us protect and promote health. It can create societal norms and help influence behaviors. It gives authority and flexibility to governments to really act in the way needed to improve the health of their community. Um, and both effective application and implementation and enforcement of law are essential to protecting and promoting health. Um, and you'll see a little graph here. I'm um, really just showing that just developing or passing a law isn't enough. You also really need to be careful about implementing, enforcing, and then evaluating the laws to make sure that they're having the desired impact, they're not unintended consequences, and then the circle kind of goes around to it really should keep going. It should be a continuous process for developing and um, moving forward. So just a high level, when we're talking about law and policy and authority to act, we're talking about a lot of things. When we talk about civil rights, I think people tend to stick with federal legislation and the Supreme Court. But just to keep in mind that at the federal, state, local, and at the tribal level, there are numbers of different types of laws, whether the Constitution, statutes, ordinances, regulations, and case law that are all really important to this work. Um, one special note to point out today is with tribal laws, we also deal often with treaties. And so the U.S. Constitution, um, Article 1, Section 8, gave the federal government authority to regulate commerce with foreign nations and included Indian tribes with that. So things like treaties are also an important part of working with tribes. And they have separate courts and a separate system also. So while they're part of the U.S., they also have a parallel structure. So this gets a little bit into what we're talking about today. Um, for Healthy People 2030, we have a federal advisory committee. Um, for the first time, we have a lawyer who sits on the committee. And so a number of briefs were written on things like health equity and data and uh, working with partners. One of the topics was on law and policy. Um, and so these, I think, are important things to kind of keep in mind as we're going throughout today. Um, law and policy are helpful as direct responses to health harming social conditions and deficiencies. We tend to see that with things like tobacco or you know, other policy seatbelt laws, but we also can see it with things like housing and civil rights laws. Um, law can help to perpetuate social conditions that are harmful to health and well-being, so that's something we want to avoid, but certainly something to look at. Redlining or things like that with housing, mortgage, um, were all important or barriers to good health there. Selective application can be based on biases that impact distribution of health and well-being. And what we talked about a minute ago, laws are hollow without absence of implementing regulations, funding, and effective enforcement. Um, and finally, laws and policies can affect health and well-being based on ways in which they're interpreted by the courts. And the brief um, is there in case you all want to read it later. So just to talk about civil rights laws and policies, um, for those of you in the room, there's a handout, just because I know there are a lot of laws I'll mention really quickly. Um, but to start with the definition of civil rights, they're such that belong to every citizen of a state or a country, or in a wider sense to all of its inhabitants, and are not connected with the organizations or administration of government. They include the rights of property, marriage, protection by laws, freedom of contract, and trial by jury. Um, just quickly, I'll kind of go over some of the selected civil rights laws. I realize this is really a selection, so I realized this morning I left out the Fair Housing Act. Hugely important, not based on importance, just uh, trying to pull some together. But to start, I think the first civil rights laws started after the Civil War. Um, we started as a nation with the Declaration of Independence, talking about life, liberty, and happiness for all. Um, but all really meant uh, white landowners with property. So over the next centuries, we've actually expanded kind of who's included in our definition of as a nation of a century and also who gets these civil rights. Um, you'll see the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment all dealt with abolishing slavery, uh, provided due process and equal protection for all, presented, prevented uh, discrimination in voting. Our first Civil Rights Act started in 1866 and talked about citizenship for all born in the U.S., but they actually excluded American Indians at that point. Um, the 19th Amendment allowed women to vote for the first time in 1920. Um, the Indian Citizenship Act um, allowed American Indian citizenship for those born in the U.S. in 1924. 
Um, then we get to a couple of really important civil rights cases um, from the Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, desegregated the schools, Simpkins versus Moses Cone, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a bit, which really um, found also uh, segregation. We needed to desegregate healthcare facilities and hospitals. Um, 1964, so the 60s, there were a lot of civil rights laws. Um, I think we all know about the Civil Rights Act, which prohibited unequal voter registration, banned discrimination on race, color, religion, and national origin, and private est public establishments, and also stopped discrimination by programs and activities receiving government funds. Um, things like the Social Security Act in 1965, which created Medicare and Medicaid, were very important to expanding um, new health uh, programs for people in the U.S. Um, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, although we had all these previous laws that talked about banning discrimination, there were still problems with voting, with poll taxes, with literacy requirements. Um, this was a really important law for that. It also helped, it talked about things with health literacy, which were helpful for um, national origin and also for American Indian populations who didn't necessarily speak English as a first language or wanted ling limited English proficiency requirements. Um, then we get into some of the equal employment opportunity, looking at um, discrimination uh, in employment. And it actually included both public and private employers with more than 15 employers, which is a big um, increase in kind of who was um, held to these. Um, and then we have things like the Title IX of the Education Amendments, which ended um, discrimination due to sex and federal funded education activities. Um, we have a couple laws on disabilities. So people with disabilities are not excluded from participation in federally funded programs and activities. That's Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, age discrimination was also addressed in the 70s um, for federal funding programs. Um, the Americans with Disability Act in 1990, I think is the seminal disability um, rights law, which looked at prohibiting discrimination on disability, requiring reasonable accommodation for employees, and also accessibility for public accommodations. Um, the Supreme Court looked at that and also said public funded entities had to work with people with disabilities in a least restrictive and most integrated way possible. Um, and then some newer laws, um, the Patient Protection and Affordability Act in 2010, um, increased new coverage options, included things like community health needs assessments, um, and then was implemented with the Rule 1557, um, which kind of consolidated all the laws around health care and discrimination um, into a new section, which we'll talk about in a bit, but um, pulled it all together for federally funded health programs and activities. Um, and then finally, uh, in 2015, Obergefell versus Hodge talked about a fundamental right to marry for same-sex couples. Um, as far as a perspective, just looking at social determinants of health, like we talked about before, you can see these are other areas that are kind of included under each. Economic stability has poverty, employment, food security, housing stability, um, education. We'll talk about social and community context, social cohesion and civic participation, discrimination and equity, incarceration are all huge parts of kind of how we fit in with the social determinants, and you can see law and policy would be relevant. Um, and then with the neighborhood and built environment, something those of you in obesity probably think about a fair amount, access to healthy foods, quality of housing, environmental conditions, are all things where law and policy and civil rights laws can be important. Um, but I'll dive into two of them, as I said. First is health and health care. Um, civil rights laws have been really integral into improving access to health care services um, and facilities and also addressing barriers, both limited English proficiency and disabilities. Um, the law helped to desegregate health care facilities. The Hill-Burton Act in 1946 provided funding for hospitals and health care facilities, federal funding. Um, it was a big push to kind of grow hospitals. Um, it did talk about prohibiting discrimination and requiring free care but it actually allowed for a separate but equal facilities in the same law. Um, even after Brown versus Board of Education, which desegregated schools, that separate but equal facilities provision was standing. So it wasn't until a case, Simpkins versus Moses Cone Memorial Hospital, which came together with the National Medical Association, the NAACP, and actually helped from the Department of Justice, um, that they brought a case saying that the separate but equal provision was unconstitutional. Um, the Fourth Circuit, so one of the circuits in the U.S. actually um, provided this opinion saying that um, it was unconstitutional, but the Supreme Court actually decided not to move in this area. And so actually 
um, upheld this in 1964, about three months before the Civil Rights Act. And so if you look at the language talking about the Civil Rights Act, um, it talks a fair amount about the fact as justification for things like Title VI, which hold that federal funding should be spent without discrimination, as justification for why this law is so important. Um, the Civil Rights Act of uh, 64 and also Medicare, which got uh, passed in 65 but really got started in 66, um, were able to make a big change in this field, partly by discrimination provisions, but also by tying federal funding to non-discrimination and to segregation. So the power of the purse um, can be very helpful in the area of civil rights laws as well. Um, and some studies that happened after these laws showed that there were health benefits from desegregation both improvements in infant mortality and also childbearing outcomes of adult daughters born after the civil rights compared to their moms before them. And so things where you can actually see a health impact um, from a law. Kind of high level, the healthcare realm also addresses other barriers. Civil rights protections, um, 1557 that I talked about provides no discrimination based on race, color, national origin, sex, or disability. Um, the final rule looking at non-discrimination in health programs and activities was the first federal civil rights law which really prevented, prevented discrimination on sex in healthcare also. Um, and it extends to health, HHS programs, health plans, and also in the insurance marketplace. Um, health literacy is part of these laws. Um, national origin includes language, and so limited English proficiency, um, language barriers, and quality of patient care must be addressed. Um, an executive order in 2000, which was upheld or agreed upon by George Bush also on the next administration, said that agencies must issue guidance to make programs more accessible. This includes interpreters and translations. Um, also protects people with disabilities. We talked about that a little bit. The Rehabilitation Act, Olmstead, all said that um, acts must be open to all and federal funds you know, should not allow barriers to folks. Um, one note for you all is that obesity is only covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act if it's seen as a physical impairment limiting activity and affecting one or more body systems. So there's a limited way it applies. Um, I am running out of time, so education um, also has an important impact on health. The attainment, as we know, improves life expectancy, obesity, and mortality. High school completion is really limited, linked to improved health, health equity, and less chance of incarceration. Um, federal funding supports public education. It includes equal access for children to prepare for a community engagement. So this should apply to all programs and activities that are federally funded, including nutrition programs and facilities, et cetera. Um, we talked about Brown versus Board of Education. Education is a really important function of state and local governments. Um, it requires school desegregation. And a study after um, Brown versus Board of Education looking at desegregation orders actually found that integration not only increased educational outcomes like graduation rates, um, but also increased funding for schools up to $1,000 per student in majority black districts after these laws. Um, inequities, you can see there are a lot um, that exists between different uh, jurisdictions. This is something that law can help to look at, but things that people out there in the field need to be able to show. Um, inequities and in things like bullies or suspension and expulsion can have an impact on long-term outcomes. Um, so one thing to keep in mind for all of these, our federal agencies are responsible for implementing, monitoring, and enforcing civil rights laws. Um, and there's some great tools and resources. This is an example of the DC school system looking at how um, laws and policies and an equity report that's out there. Um, and I am out of time, so I'll just say really quickly, um, the civil rights approaches can be used kind of broadly. Um, there was a, another National Academy report on communities in action, pathways to health equity, which did a nice job of looking at civil rights laws and had some really great community examples. Um, and just as far as limitations, and I'll go to my last slide here quick, and I'm happy to talk about these later too. Um, I think something we've talked about is equality and equity. I think civil rights laws can help us to get everybody up to equality. Um, they do a nice job of prohibiting, dis prohibiting discrimination, of really showing um, that we need to have our federal funding going to the right means, but they don't necessarily get to equity. And so working with communities, making sure we're dealing with data, thinking about things like voluntary compliance, really thinking proactively how we can get to the point we're not dealing with these really long, drawn out civil rights cases, but trying to think about the best things for our communities hopefully can help us get to equity. Um, and with that, I will sit down. <laughs> Thank you.